Welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I'm joined by Pete Jarvis, who is a drummer, percussionist, arranger, performer, composer, conductor. Pete, you have a lot of hats. Welcome to the show. <laughs> Thank you very much, Bart. Yeah, so um, I am really honored to have you on the show. You, you've really, really had an amazing career. Um, I want to give a quick shout out before we even start to Tim Northup and uh, Jim Messina, who both were talking and said, we got to get Pete over to Bart to get him on the show. And a couple days later, here we are. So I love how quick it was. Yes. And uh, I would like to thank Tim and Jim as well. Yeah. And all right. So the topic for today, which I mean, I just want to talk about you and your life, but I think the key thing that we're going to kind of take away from this for people who are listening, because I like to have a topic is um, really how to have a career that's that's long and that's multifaceted. And it's not just one gig and then you're kind of done or you're waiting a year for the other one. When we spoke on the phone uh, yesterday, I got a, a lot from you just of, of once you're doing one gig, you got to be working on your next one. So that's sort of what we're going to get to. And you've done a lot of film, TV, conducting, Broadway, just an amazing amount of stuff. But that being said, why don't you tell us about you first, like what got you into drumming and music and how you became the sort of uh, renaissance man that you are today? At an early age, uh, for me, it seems like an early age 10, of course, some people start much younger. I just took the opportunity to join the school band uh, when that opportunity became available. And I immediately became interested in drums and it was not on a particularly serious level. I loved it, and I immediately became completely immersed in it. It took over all of my my interests yeah. outside of school. In other words, until then, I was more involved with Little League Baseball and things like that, and I became far less interested in those things and immediately gravitated toward music. And... From that point forward, there was really just no turning back. It's just been a just a straight course ahead with music. Yeah, I always think it's pretty amazing to think of just you don't realize as a little boy in school that this thing that you're doing in this class is going to shape the rest of your life. But I guess that's true with a, a, a little kid, boy or girl who likes science. They might become a scientist. You don't realize when you're that young, when you're 10 years old, that, oh, I'm going to be doing this for the next 50 years, 50 plus years. Um, pretty cool. Yeah, it is. It is amazing. I mean, I certainly, I mean, what 10 year old kid really, well, there's certainly be a very rare 10 year old kid that had a sense of what they wanted to do with the rest of their life at the age of 10. And I'm not sure I did. In fact, I'm reasonably sure I did. One thing I do know is that playing drums and being in the school band was the thing that I enjoyed more than any other thing. That's great. So then how did you then take it from something that you love to something that you get paid to do? You know, how did that switch happen? Obviously not as a 10 year old, I'm sure you played for years and played with school band, but how did you kind of, how did you go from an amateur to a professional? I studied at the end of high school before I, uh, when I chose to go on to college to major in music. I was fortunate to get connected to an exceptional teacher, exceptional drummer, Joey Cass. And I remember the first lesson very first lesson I had with Joey, uh, was he asked me what I wanted to do with drums. And I told him I wanted to play on Broadway and play shows because I had done them in high school, and I just, I just loved them. Uh, and he said, okay, that's fine, but not the answer I'm looking for. <laughs> and he went on to, to explain that what I needed to do at that point was simply play everything that came up. Take every opportunity, no matter what it is, and say no to nothing. Mm. Because I didn't know enough at that point, he pointed out to me, to make such a 
decision of, of, a, of a specialized nature or aspect of, of the business. He said, what you need to do now is get yourself exposed to everything you can get you're exposed to. Learn as much as you can learn and go to school for music. And then after a while, you begin to say, well, this is where I would like to yeah. focus. This is where I'd like to turn some focused attention. Hmm. And uh, I took that advice and I started playing in everything I could play. And I played in the local marching band on the uh, Memorial Day parades, 4th of July and so forth. Uh, the New York, New Jersey Volunteer Firemen's Association Marching Band. <laughs> That's a mouthful. <laughs> and we, did, and you know, we did we did these gigs and uh, on on those days, and we made a little bit of money for it, and I really enjoyed that. And I got in a rock band, and uh, it just it kept playing in the school bands. Tried to do the summer productions and all the musicals just tried to do absolutely everything that I could do hmm. uh, following Joey Cass's advice. Then when I went into college, I met another one of my mentors who had a very specific course of study. And I, get, I, I took that very seriously, studying new music and percussion ensemble. And then, of course, with that comes studying malice, timpani, and, you know, all the many aspects of sure. percussion. Uh, and I went on with that and felt like I got a little bit of training that perhaps enabled me to branch out and, and see where I might be able to fit in. Hmm. That's awesome. So um, I just love, first off, out of all of that, I just love how the idea of say no to nothing, um, which is just very cool because I think you need to take on a lot of experiences, which, uh, you know, sometimes it's easier said than done because it's like that's a lot of work and uh, it's it's kind of easy to just say, no, I'm going to do this. I'm going to be a rock drummer. But um, when you're not saying no to things, and you're just going, all right, I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll do it. You'll you'll get so much experience. And and that those experiences had to also make relationships with people, which I, I'm I'm assuming we'll learn about this more later, but relationships with other musicians and people in general, as we all know as musicians, is so important. So I think you getting all this experience with not only the players and performing, but just working with a bunch of different personality types and, and all those things, that, that had to be helpful in the future. Absolutely critical as as I look back at it. At the time, I was just doing it, and I was enjoying it. I did find as I was moving along, especially at that stage of my life, uh, when I first was advised to do that, you know, I was a high school kid. At that at that stage of my life, you know, I, I just enjoyed everything. I just enjoyed just playing, period. Yeah. I didn't care what it, what it was. I was fortunate to get the opportunity to play in a big band. Uh, and that was a wonderful experience. So while I was playing in the marching band and rock bands, I was also playing in a big band and doing everything I could do. And uh, although I had already been into it and interested in it for years, uh, that same teacher, Joey Cass, really stressed the importance of reading music. And that there was no no substitute for that, and you just simply needed to put in whatever time was required to sure. become proficient at that. Yeah. Don't let me get ahead here, but you you've got I just think a, a really cool subject that you've worked on is is I, I know this didn't happen right out of college or whatever. I'm sure it took some time, but I'd love to discuss um, and we can jump around chronologically. But your your work on film, TV, um. And, and even getting into Broadway and stuff like that. But I, I've had some people ask about um, how film drumming works, um, particularly with movies that have a very drum focused um, score. Like people typically think of like Birdman with like Antonio Sanchez and things like yes. that. Now, you have worked on uh, you worked on Moonrise Kingdom by uh, with a film by Wes Anderson, which just was just awesome. His movies are all just really, really cool, and uh, and the music is great. How did you get into that 
role. And then I want to talk about the actual process of what it was like to record and and scoring a um, a movie like that, a big, big uh, Golden Globe nominated movie for the best score. Um, what was that like and how did you get into uh, making music for film? Well, it's almost a funny story how I got into it, but which I'll tell you just a second, but it does directly tie into what we were just talking about. I think one of the reasons that I was first contacted by Wes's office was because my experiences were so vast. I, I, I had my hands in so many different things that it aspects of music that I think it made me seem qualified to at least get a shot from him. That is to say, he was looking for somebody. The, the movie, for anyone who's seen it, for those of you who have not, the movie has a lot of percussion moments in it where it's sort of marching band type uh, music sure. behind these scenes of Boy Scouts marching with Ed Norton and so forth. And uh, Wes wanted somebody who was a composer, a percussionist, a conductor, and someone who had access to a lot of percussion players. So that's four very specific things. Yeah. And and I I had that. I, I, I don't know exactly how it worked. I imagine, I don't know this, but I would imagine that he had one of his interns or somebody search for those qualifications or search for somebody that met those qualifications. And I guess in his search, my name came up because I had never done any film music. It was a brand new experience to me. Yeah. And I, I, and I guess if you're looking for, again, a conductor, percussionist, composer, uh, and somebody who has access to percussion players and you search for that, it's not going to take a long time before my name comes up because I was a director of the New Jersey percussion ensemble I'd been conducting for years, composing for years, and playing for years. So uh, I think from there, he just gave me a, a shot. And the funny part of the story that I alluded to earlier was I was uh, in the library, one of the schools where I was teaching, and it was the first week of of school, you know, first week of September or, or, you know, very early September, the first week of school. And like most of us, I tend not to open emails when I don't recognize sure. the name, the sender. Yeah. So here was an email from, from a name I didn't recognize. And I was just about to delete it. <laughs> and I said, you know what? It's the first week of school. Yeah. Perhaps it's a student who has a question about registration and somebody wants to get involved and, you know, doesn't quite know the ropes yet. And so I said, let, let me open it up. And so I opened the email and it turned out to be from Wes's office saying, Wes Anderson uh, would like to invite you to come and talk to him about his movie. Oh, man. Would you be interested in doing that? <laughs> Jeez. Good thing you, you didn't know, delete that. <laughs> Uh, yes, you know, I'd be interested in doing that. And then, uh, yeah, for sure. Um, I, I hope that he would have found me one way or another, yeah. but that's the funny part of it. I mean, it was one of the nicest breaks I had and I, I came within seconds of deleting it. Uh, and never even seeing the email. You're obviously a very established musician. You've done some very big things, but I think for everyone in the entertainment, you know, overarching like subject, which is all of us, were you just like over the moon? I mean, to be invited to do like to work on a movie, that's like a very specific, special kind of, of thing. I mean, you must have just been blown away. Yeah, I was I, I was blown away. Uh, I was surprised um, because I didn't know what he was looking for. So I didn't know that there were three or four or so particular things that I happened to have experience in. So I was wondering why he was contacting me, to be perfectly honest with you. Uh, so, yeah, I was over the moon, to say the least. Yeah. Uh, and uh, 
I got back to him, and then we set up a meeting, and I went and met him in New York and watched the movie. Uh, some of it's still on green screen, and he said what he wanted, this, that, and the other thing, and uh, asked if I could get that done, and I said, yes, I could get that done, and he gave me a chance, and uh, he ended up being satisfied with my work. Wow. And there again, it was he did say – in the interview in our meeting that he wanted to be sure that I could have access to any number of percussion players that we might need. It turned out we needed four besides me. Uh, and he said he wanted to be uh, sure that if something needed to be conducted in the percussion music, that I could do that. And we just went on over those four basic needs that he immediately had for this project, this mm -hmm. aspect of the project, and uh, he was right. satisfied that I was qualified and he gave me a chance. Hmm. Now, uh, from so once you get the gig and all that stuff, um, I want to talk more about even the specifics of how it works, because I've had um, a request for an episode a while ago from uh, Owen Van Houten, I think I'm pronouncing your last name right, Owen, about film drums and film and animation and he actually specifically said uh isle of dogs which was a wes anderson movie which which had like taiko drumming with the like it's almost like claymation kind of stop motion stuff on screen but we're we're still i think we're we're pretty darn close with a wes anderson movie that had a lot of drumming so i think we can speak to it <laughs> a little bit sure um all right so how did that go were you then because you're in you're in New York at that point. I'm assuming Wes Anderson was doing things in in California. Well, his cutting room was in New York, or maybe I should say maybe I should say one of his cutting rooms. For all I know, he has more than one. But but he had a cutting room in New York, uh, and was working out of there all the time. And I live in New Jersey, just twenty minutes outside of New York. So yeah. getting getting back and forth and all that was. Just, just no issue. Now, did you choose a studio to record in your... So obviously you composed the music, you did all that, but did you choose a studio of your uh, liking to actually do the recording? Or was it like a Wes Anderson kind of approved, come into the studio, set up? H how did the recording process go? Uh, the recording was done at uh, Electric Lady, which is a studio that yeah. in Greenwich Village, which is, of course, Jimmy, uh, the studio Jimi Hendrix designed and built uh i guess back in the late 60s uh middle or late 60s and west west chose that uh for a couple reasons uh they do have an incredible mixing board as i understood it it's one of only a handful i think under 5 remaining in the world it's a very unique mixing board and it's an incredible recording studio. I mean, it really is. It really is top of the line. Yeah, and sure. of the engineer that Wes works with, or one of the engineers that Wes works with, certainly the one he was working with on this project, works out of that studio. And it was just right in Greenwich Village. It was just right. You know, it was very accessible to all involved. Yeah. So uh, now Wes Wes picked that. It seems very Wes Anderson to to record there. I think everyone who's familiar with his work, and if you're not, Google it. There's the Royal Tenenbaums and Darjeeling Limited, and and all these Isle of Dogs. All these movies are great. They have a feel. No one can deny that there is not a Wes Anderson style uh, life aquatic. I mean, it just you can watch it for yeah. thirty seconds and go, oh, that's a Wes Anderson movie. Um, no so, question about that. Yeah, so that that feels like that. So so you then would perform your pieces. Would you have a screen up watching the uh, film, or were you more just I know yes. what I need to do? He would he would, he would be running uh, the scenes for us, and we'd be and we'd be playing, watching yes. the scene that the music was for. Uh, actually, when you mentioned some of those other movies and how they're uniquely Wes's. Uh, style and, and so forth, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I, that was one of the things that helped me, That I, one of the observations that helped me move the project probably in a way that helped me ultimately get the final gig. Because the very first thing I did was 
get all of his movies. Of course. Uh, and, and watch all of his movies. And one of the things I noticed right away was exactly what you just said. Uh, you know, you can watch just just very brief moment of it, and you realize right away this could only be Wes Anderson. And although they were all uniquely his style and uniquely his work, they were in no way similar. No. And so I realized that uh, from watching all those movies, the one thing or one of the things I didn't want to do was try and duplicate or emulate in any way the, the music that was on these other the soundtracks of these other movies, as sometimes you'll find that happens in movies, you know, when sure. the, the music ends up sounding sometimes similar as staging might seem similar or other aspects of it might seem similar when you're working with the same director. But in Wes's case, it seemed like in each movie, the music fit the character of the movie, the particular scene and so on and so forth. And, it had to be unique to the moment. And so that I felt to be liberating when it came time to actually composing the music. Yeah. So I didn't feel like I needed to try and, and sound like somebody else or, you know, work along the lines of somebody else worked. I just needed to look at the scenes, deal with the scenes and write the music that I thought best fit it. And yeah. that was, uh, that was real as i say that was really liberating yeah and it's a unique film where it's the the little kids who were kind of having like a the boy scout uh <laughs> camp it turns kind of military and with that sort of drumming that you're talking about and i need to rewatch i haven't seen it in a few years i need i need to rewatch it now that we've been talking about it and i can uh it's almost like you hear it in a different way when you know the person involved <laughs> so i got to oh yeah sure rewatch it but all right so uh, one last thing about the film stuff, and then I want to maybe talk about some other things with your career, but get to the point of like, how can people take you as an example and uh, learn from it and make their own um, 50 plus year career? Let's talk about Boardwalk Empire, which for people who don't know, was an HBO series that was uh, just really cool. It was about Atlantic City. It had Steve Buscemi and a bunch of great actors. Um, I really enjoyed it. Um Martin Scorsese directed it. Is that right? Produced it. I think there Produced. were various directors. It was on for five seasons. Yep. I think throughout the time, different different people got involved in directing. But but Martin Scorsese was uh, the the producer. So did that come directly because of your previous film experience? That was obviously post Moonrise Kingdom, correct? Right, and that's a another kind of story that, in a very loose way, ties back to. The very first thing I talked about where, you know, do everything, you never know what's going to come out of it. Uh, as my first uh, mentor suggested, it we were recording Moonrise Kingdom, and I stayed on late after one session, so all the percussionists were gone because we were going to add a timpani part to a Benjamin Britten piece, which was all strings. Mm. Uh, and Wes wanted to add a timpani part to it. So I wrote the timpani part, and when it came time to record it, it was just going to be me playing, so all the percussionists you know, were done and they left. And that was just me and Wes and the engineer and uh, the music supervisor. And the music supervisor, which I didn't know at the time, uh, just through my inexperience, the music supervisor plays a very important role in, in every aspect of the music on mm -hmm. a movie. And uh, music supervisor was there, and it happened to be the same music supervisor for Boardwalk Empire. So now we're finishing up this recording session where I was adding the timpani, as I said, and uh, in Moonrise Kingdom, and they were about to add some music to a scene in the second season of Boardwalk Empire. Um, I could describe the scene because it stands out so much. A lot of people remember they happened to be on the boardwalk, and it's a kind of violent scene. The, the, uh, a couple of people end up really beaten down on a police officer. A mm -hmm. marching band comes around the corner. And um, 
Anyway, uh, they were about to add some drums to go along with, frankly, the violence of the uh, of the scene. And there was somebody there who wasn't really a drummer, but played a little bit of had a little bit of drum experience, and he was going to play. And uh, I happened to be there, finished the other one, and music supervisor said, "Would you like to stick around and play for?" you know, another hour or two. And I said, you know, absolutely. Yeah. And uh, I said, what, what do you have in mind? He said, well, we're going to add some music to this scene in Boardwalk Empire. And it was just, they were just filming the second year and I hadn't seen the first season. So I really didn't know what Board em- Boardwalk Empire was. I mean, I had not seen it. And uh, I said, sure. And he said, we're going to do a scene. For-. And when he said that, it didn't, light up my face or anything. He said, have you ever seen, I said, you know, I got to be honest. He said, no, I'm afraid I don't, I don't know what that is. And, uh, he said, well, he went on explained it to me. It was an HBO series and so forth. And he said, so would you like to, uh, improvise some drums over this scene? And I said, yes. And then we did that. Uh, and then from there, Apparently, he was satisfied with my work because I went on to be to include music over the next the remaining four seasons. Wow! So that was a, a case of being in the right place at the right time. I mean, I finished up a recording session. The music supervisor was the music supervisor for the next recording session, and he said, "Well, why don't you just go play the drums for this?" And I said, "I'd love to." And then. I was in Boardwalk Empire for the next five years. Man, I mean, it's, uh, you don't know what's going to lead to the next thing. I, I've had that experience with working on the dialogue stuff that I've, I explained to you on the phone that, I, that I've done where you fix people's lines, you do all this stuff, but I've had it where it's the person who's like the, the ADR mixer or whatever, whoever's on the, on the line with you, they might say, oh, I like that studio, let's work with them again. Or, and then maybe three or four times in, like I, I worked on a bunch of the Dick Wolf, like Chicago Med, uh, Chicago PD, Law and Order, and it was like the same uh, person. And it was like, oh yeah, they like you, they can trust you. No one wants to go out and try new people all the time and have different results. Like with you and Boardwalk Empire, it's like, oh yeah, Pete's great. Get Pete back. You know, <laughs> it's yeah. I was lucky, and he didn't even have to to get me back. I mean, I was standing there in a room. There exactly. was percussion equipment all over the place. Yeah, and the guy said, "You want to go play drums?" And there was a drum set. That, you know, I said, "Yes, I do." I I always found it fascinating that that work where you were just speaking about that you do with the uh, yeah the dialogue voice, replacement and- voice. Is, is synchronization also that you're working on? Yeah, I mean, it's been COVID. I, I haven't done it in about a year and a half or whatever. But yeah, so it'll be a couple different things where uh, um, like the the actor, sometimes they'll be turned They're Like uh, my, my boss worked on uh, like the Hunger Games where PETA, you know, the, the Josh um, Hutcherson, I think is his name. His back was to it and he's like yelling and it got kind of messed up. So you can, when their back is turned, you can put in whatever you want. You know, like you can, if you don't see their mouth, you can have them say whatever they want. But um, if you want, if the ca- if the actor's facing you, then yeah, you do, you drop in your three beeps. And then on the invisible fourth beep, that's when the actor would drop in his lines. Like, um, like I did, uh, speaking of HBO, I worked on The Deuce, um, which was, a you know, uh, James Franco and Maggie Gyllenhaal and all these people. I worked on like a smaller kind of side actor who was in town, but, but yeah, his, his mouth is on screen. So you, I would have my cue sheet. I would, um, line it up where I used actually, I think the drumming, the, the, it's kind of minor, but the rhythm of beep, 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 come on, baby would be like the line that he did. It was really short. He just needed to fix it of saying, come on, baby, or something like that. So I use the invisible right on that fourth beep is when he does his line and I roll six or seven takes of it uh i loop it and i just send the the crew from hbo or whoever the film whatever it is um the the file but if you do animated stuff it's totally different where there's no sync to picture uh you're just recording dialogue like the newer the latest one i did was the trolls movie and you're uh you're just recording lines there's no they don't have the um animation yet so you can just record 
Um, you just record it out in the wild. And I, I just think the crazy thing about this is, let's say on a movie, it, it, it's kind of a testament to Wes Anderson and those guys. You're at Electric Lady recording these drum parts. He's simultaneously got people recording dialogue replacement with all these other actors, when all the other actors are probably in different cities or countries working on their next movie, the the orchestration of getting everything done is just unbelievable, you know? Yes, uh, the, the scheduling and the overlapping of the tasks and so forth is uh, an art form all to itself. Yeah, absolutely. It's cool stuff. Now, now to keep again with our theme of advice for people to have a long career, what tips would you maybe give to our listeners or a student of yours or anyone? I, I know that it's just don't say no to things, just keep doing it. But is there any tips you would have on how to get into working on uh, films of any level? I mean, you're not going to start out day one working on Wes Anderson movies. Um, any tips you can give people? I really wish there were because I would I could make a suggestion, but I don't know that it would lead to anything. And one of the things that I would first suggest to a young composer or any composer who wants to get involved with film would be to get involved with film. And one of the ways you need to do that, I think, is to be willing to take some chances, be willing to invest some time in something that you know might not necessarily go where you would like it to go. And that's one of the chances I'm talking about taking. Yeah. So I, I would say, and perhaps this might be a little bit easier in the New York area because there's so much uh, film being made on all levels. There's a lot of schools, universities, and colleges, and film schools. There's just so much film being made by, by students, and they very often need music. Yeah. So I would say if you were a young composer, you should find these places and get down there and meet the young filmmakers. You need to establish in my opinion, and this goes beyond filmmaking, but I think you need to establish relationships with people of your generation. Uh, so if you're a young composer, you should try and get involved with some young filmmakers. They tend to see things perhaps through uh, a similar lens because of the their, their age might be similar and they have a similar sometimes view of, of the world and, and sure. where we live. And that makes it perhaps easier to relate to one another. You're not trying to relate your art to their art when you have such different points of reference in your life. So I, I think uh, just by how long you've been alive. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's very important to get down to a film school and, and get in there and, I don't know, maybe go at lunchtime, meet some young filmmakers and say, hey, are you, you know, young film, you know, you're making a film, you know, I want to write some music, you know, perhaps we can collaborate and things like that. I think you just need to go to where the film is being made. And get yourself involved. Just just introduce yourself to the people and meet people and, and watch and keep an open mind and be willing to be part of something is very important. Not necessarily feel like you're running something. It's very important to realize that it might be looked at as you producing music for someone else's movie, not to find a movie that fits your music and, exactly. and be willing to, to look at it in, in ways that don't necessarily put you right away at the top yeah. and, and be willing to, to work on that. And when I said earlier, you take some chances. Well, those projects could take months and months 
and they might just absolutely flop. Yeah. And 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 now you've invested months. Uh, so patience is in order. Uh, no one likes to hear that, but it's true. Yeah. Uh, patience is in order, and of course, you want to try and use good judgment. Involve yourself with things that you're interested in, things that you think you can add to, or things that can, you know, you can mutually complement each other and yeah. have some patience trying to trying to put it together. And I think use your judgment with anything. It just seems like also you need to, if, if you're working with people in a film where you go, this is weird, this doesn't feel right, this is like shady, something's going on here, um, you don't want it to hurt your reputation by being associated with something where they're not paying people or, or things are getting, um, just, you know, use your, use your judgment too, I think is, is key. And I want to also ask you, so this seems, we kind of skimmed over it, but so you're a drummer, like, and a percussionist. Now, how does a drummer percussionist become a composer? Are you, uh, literate in writing music for all different types of instruments? Do you play other instruments? How, how are you, able to be a composer if you're a drummer and a percussionist? Well, I do not play other instruments, but I, th I feel quite literate in, in many, many instruments, uh, certainly of the perhaps Western orchestral world. Gotcha. Uh, you know, the strings, the wind. I feel, I feel pretty good about knowing something about those instruments. Of, not, not at all how to play. It's like when people can read a language but not speak it kind of thing? I can understand what you mean there, but uh, there were a couple of ways where I, I felt like I became comfortable with other instruments. First, through playing chamber music. Okay. Uh, where you were playing with, in oh, say, a sextet that has one percussion and five other instruments or something like that. It's just a random example. It could be anything. Uh you have to begin to become familiar with those instruments in order to make the music work, in order to make the music blend, be comfortable, and do all the things that we know music needs to do, all these things we're familiar with. In order to do that, you've got to spend some time working with people playing those instruments and, and trying to get to understand what they do and, and let them see what you do. And, and through that, that work, you can begin to develop some of that, some of that experience and knowledge. But then secondly, perhaps more importantly on some levels, uh, perhaps, I don't know. I became a conductor very early on once I got to uh, the university level of studying. And I was fortunate enough to get to conduct a very good group. And I was fortunate enough to, also get to conduct students and that I learned a tremendous amount from that because there was no rush you know when you're conducting a professional situation it's very often you just start rehearsing and before you know what the concert comes up there's not a lot of time to do everything you know you're working with professionals everybody knows what to do and you do it and you kind of help organize it and stuff like that but you know everybody already knows their job and, and knows how to do it or they wouldn't be there. That's one situation. Sure. But when you're conducting with students, it's a different situation. And there's not usually a deadline. You can start working on a piece, for example, at the beginning of a school year in September, October, and maybe not have a concert till March. And maybe in that in that interim you can have twenty rehearsals. Well, that's where you can really take stuff apart and put it back together and really get to understand some of the intricacies of how these instruments interact with one another and, and all the things that we know they do. So conducting students and conducting professionals, ideally at the best at the same time, and then even better when you have a professional group that is augmented by students. Uh, it's that can that can really be a an ear opening experience. You can constantly compare the two uh, and see what makes one one and what makes the other the other. Yeah. Uh, so conducting, I think, is uh, 
the very short answer to your to your question. So yeah, that's no, that's perfect. And I mean, as we you know getting towards the end of the episode, I'd love to just kind of focus in on on what we said originally was the real topic at hand here. And you told me some great stuff when we spoke on the phone um, the other day that I'd love to share with people about um, really how you plan for a long career and just talking about how you're planning for your next gig. Because one key takeaway I've gotten so far is is you're not, uh, I'm sure people, like there's many drummers who just do Broadway and it's great. They just do film stuff. It's great. But you have taken the route of having um, a very, very diverse career and and obviously that's led to you having many different jobs over the years. What would you recommend? Let's take some time to talk about what you would recommend for people on having a, a long, um, like I said, diverse career. Actually, I'd like to say at the outset, because I think it's relevant, my experience on Broadway is, is really quite minimal. Um, I, haven't, I haven't played on Broadway much at all, but it didn't take much for it to become relevant to me in terms of how to just have another tool sort of that available and, and use what I learned in that experience in other experiences. And I think that's really important to, to, to get what you can learn from, from situations, no matter where you are in your career and have something else to apply to the next next gig you're never finished learning a sort of quick answer but not not you know to really have a long career it's got to be 24 7 i mean you have to live music eat music drink dream music everything about you know just beginning to end every day that's just what you do uh and you never finish but one of the things that I was saying, which you just alluded to in your question, was in the planning. I do tend to plan long term and short term. And to a younger student, perhaps, what I'm thinking of by more longer term would be perhaps a little more difficult to relate to because perhaps some of them are at very early stages and are 20 years old. But when I started composing, I did it planning for what would happen 20 years later. And I was already in the middle of a large part of my career. Why was that? Well, it was actually in 1998. I already, even though I was playing for when I was 10, it was really when I got to college that I started getting professional gigs. And that was 1977, 78. So in 1998, I had about 20 years in. And I started planning for what I would be doing 20 years later. Uh, I started to think that percussionists, and I had noticed percussionists retiring a little bit earlier than perhaps some other musicians because of the physical demands of it, schlepping equipment and getting around, instead of just, just what's physically demanded as a percussionist. I would say almost in the same way where a basketball player's knees give out. Mm -hmm. And even though they they still understand basketball and they can still be in great shape and they can still do all the things that they have to do, but their knees don't work anymore. Uh, You know, these kinds of, these kinds of things. Well, I, I, I thought percussion playing and I feel like I had seen it with other percussion has happened. And I simply didn't want to be out of the game at that point. That was one of the reasons I started composing. Uh, because I wanted to start then because I figured some 20 years later, which is now two or three years ago, because this was in 1998, I was hoping if 20 years later I had to stop playing, which I have not, I don't intend to stop for quite some time, but if in 20 years or so, when I reached around 60, I had to stop playing, I didn't want to have the next part of my career have to be approached as a beginner. Yeah. I wanted to have 20 years of experience composing. So at the point where composing might take over as the focal point of my career, I wanted a couple decades of experience. So I might be able to actually do something and enter that world 
uh, as something other than a beginner. So that was the sense of, of what I would consider to be longer term planning. And I have plans for, you know, 20 years from now, but in shorter term, I simply try to never be doing a project without another project in my mind, if not in the planning stages. So that went up because sometimes when you finish a project, there can be that sort of moment of a void. Yeah. Well, you don't have anything to do and you got to look for the next thing to do or wait for the next thing to do or feel like, okay, that's done. Now I'm going to spend some time catching up on all the things that I neglected and all these things that we know about. But of those, I think the most important one is finishing a job and you emotionally can have a moment where now nothing's happening and it can be hard to get out of that. It can be hard to find something to start and and trying to get that level of passion up that you concluded your last project at. So I try to overlap them. Yeah. Uh, whenever I'm on a project, I I know what the next project is, if not what the next several projects are going to be, or at least what I would like them to be, or I'm trying to move in that direction. That keeps me moving. And as long as I'm moving and moving forward, I feel like I can stay in the game. And then, like I said, the longer-term planning gives you a direction to try and move in. So what I, what I just do is not necessarily random. I mean, if I have nothing at the moment, and something comes up, I'm going to do it just about no matter what it is. But I try and pick and choose the things that I involve myself with to help realize my long-term plans. Yeah. I mean, that is just so many things in there are just so, uh, I mean, the key takeaway is just always have something next in the books. I, I have a client who I do video work for every other week. And it's, I mean, it's a substantial part of my income. And, but the downside of it is, is this is one guy where I go and film and I do these, I live stream, well, during COVID, I live stream these seminars that are six hours long for psychologists, N not drum related. But again, if you're going to do video and audio, you gotta, you're not, it's not all working on movies and stuff. Um, so, but if, if he cancels one day out of the month, it's like, oh, geez, there goes a check that is, uh, a substantial portion, like I said, of like a monthly income. So it's you, you're so smart to be planning ahead. And I think that's cross it's Yes, it's drumming, which is what we're here to talk about or playing music. But um, that's kind of smart in life in general. Um, it's just to to kind of have something going on on in the, you know, around the bend to be working on to be growing to be um, kind of moving up, always growing is a key thing that I think you you are obviously um, very smart about. What motivates you? I mean, you have to, you're a human. You have to have these days or months or weeks where you're like, I, I just don't feel like doing this. I'm, I'm, I'm happy with how things are right now. What, what pushes you forward? A couple things push me forward, but one of them is the reality, certainly in the New York area, where if you don't answer the phone a couple times or you say no too many times in a row, they stop asking. There's a lot of cats around here. And that can be an advantage or perhaps a disadvantage. But if you say no to gigs too many times, there are an incredible amount of people who will take that gig. And once a producer who's ever running a gig director of a group, whoever it might be, gets used to one person saying no and another person saying yes, the first call goes to the person who said yes. Sometimes you have to say yes to things that you might not necessarily feel like doing at the time, but you just know that, that you don't want to lose your sort of uh, – spot on the on the front of the mind of the contract so part of the time again it's 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 thinking of of longevity it just comes with the nature of the business that 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 
you know, what I hate to put it, but you know, what have you done for me lately? You know, yeah. the, these old cliches and, and, you know, you're as good as your last gig. And, you know, if people can't even remember your last gig, they're not calling you for the next, you know, you just, you just feel, you know, to maintain a career, I feel like part of it is to just, just stay active. Yeah. And then to be perfectly honest at times where, you know, like you said, everyone feels like, yes, you know, not today, not whatever, you know, I could, I just don't do it. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, there's, there's times when I stop and do do something else, but uh, they they don't come up quite as frequently as the times when I <laughs> keep going. Uh, but yeah, if you if you need a day off, take a day off. I mean, that that's that's probably critical to to producing producing good work. You know, one one thing that that sort of ties into a couple of the things that you you mentioned, and as you said we're getting near the end. Uh, I can speak with you all day, but as we get near the end, one other bit of advice I would offer, particularly to, to younger players, is to follow the advice of people who know what they're talking about. Now that gets a little vague. Know what they're talking about. What does that mean? But it, I, and and I don't know that I know myself. But I do know that there's a lot of students who ask their teachers questions or just have information volunteered from their teachers, and they just don't follow the advice. Yeah, and they don't understand that they they don't have the perspective of somebody with more experience and. You need to follow the advice, in my opinion, of those who have these experiences behind them. And I really find that to be perhaps missing in in some younger students who naturally are a little bit less patient and really want to, like, jump right to the end game. And sure skip some of the steps that might be advised to them along the way. I do yeah. not recommend that. No. And I, I also think too, one last note that I've always kind of found that I've spoken about on the show too, is you never know who's watching you play. You never know who's listening. Like I, with every episode I do of these shows, it's like, you never know where this is going to take you and who's going to hear it. So make every episode count, make every performance count. Um, because again, even the simplest little gig, if you kind of throw it away, oh, uh, Wes Anderson might have been in the audience or something like yeah. that, you know? Oh boy. Yeah. Yes. And yes. Um, and now, yeah, I, I hope everybody, uh, really heard and paid attention to what you just said. Uh, going back again to what I was just saying about following advice, even if you have to take your time at that, another one of my mentors, uh, I have three or four. And another one of my mentors told me back in the 80s, it's significant that it was the 80s because the first piece I wrote was in 1998. And he told me back in the 80s that he thought college students should spend time composing, conducting, and performing. Now, how that time gets divided up would be, of course, based on what your majors. If you're a performance major, then, you know, the, the lion's share is going to be performing, but you still need to compose and conduct. And, of course, if you're a composer, the lion's share will be composing and so on and so forth. But he did say that it, it's he felt it was important for performers to know what a conductor is is thinking and trying to do, and the way to do that is to learn something about conducting and vice versa, and composers need to be able to think somewhat like a performer to some degree to to understand what performers' needs are. Performers need to be able to put themselves in the shoes of composers so that they can, and, and the way all of these three things can relate to each other. And I remember that, that advice very, very, you know, really 
took took root. But I was focusing on my playing and conducting very strongly at the time, very strongly, many many hours. You know, just just really focused work. And yeah. in 1998, which was now about 15 years or so after he told me that, or at least over 10, I said, "Okay, now I'm gonna." finish that third step that I was told was critical. Uh, so it took me 10 years to get started, but then I started composing. And that was another reason that I started composing a question you asked me earlier. It was because one of my mentors said, you need to compose, conduct, and play to really get perspective on this. And I was already playing and conducting. So I thought it time to uh, follow the man's advice and start composing yeah absolutely well you gotta i don't know you you have to be a little bit of a self-starter too on top of all that and just and i just love it take people's advice and all that good stuff and um i think this has been awesome i want to um again thank uh tim northup and jim messina for connecting us and having you share your time with us today um and i hope everyone has really enjoyed getting all this information and just hearing about someone who's had a very, very, very long career that has not stopped at all. Um, Pete has been uh, kind enough that he's going to hang out for a couple extra minutes. And I want to ask him about another movie he worked on, which is Ang Lee's Billy Lynn's Long Halftime Walk, uh, which has a really cool story about kind of recreating a marching band kind of uh, uh, sound and the drumming and there's no music and he had to do it anyway. And it's a really cool story. So if you'd like to hear that bonus episode and all of the other ones that I've done uh, over the last couple months, you can go to drumhistorypodcast.com and there's a Patreon button and you can click that and join up. And I uh, really appreciate everyone who's been doing it recently. Got a bunch of new patrons for the show, which just helps keep everything going. So um, on that note, Pete, where can people find you? Is there a good place that if they want to get in touch with you, um, anything like that? Uh, yeah, but before I give that information, I do want to take a second to thank you sure. uh, for having me and to congratulate you on your your podcast. I mean, 108, and I guess now maybe this is the 109th. That is a lot of episodes. Oh, yeah. Uh, and congratulations on the great work because uh, you bring a lot of information. You allow people to access a lot of information that they otherwise would might not be able to access. So not well, only you. congratulations, but thank you. It is my pleasure. The, the, the best part is getting to talk to people like you and, uh, and have people who I trust recommend people, uh, like you. And I, I hope it's providing, um, you know, joy. And I, I always get notes from people saying, Hey, it's really great on my drive home or my commute or, um, you know, when I'm working out or sitting out by the fire, drinking a beer, uh, I listen. So I, I love hearing that stuff. So thank you for saying that. Um, and, uh, on that note, Pete, thank you for being here. My pleasure. Thank you, Bart. If you like this podcast, find me on social media at drum history, and please share rate and leave a review and let me know topics that you would like to learn about in the future until next time. Keep on learning.